Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hi. So you probably have seen that there was two names uh, at the beginning on the on this talk, and you probably have counted that there is only one body right now on the stage. So yeah, there was some last minute changes, and I will be presenting myself. Let me first uh, quickly tell you more about what I'm doing in Google. Uh, so yeah, my full name is Vyacheslav. Just don't try to pronounce it. Slavo is good enough. Uh, in the Google, I'm leading a small team that's trying to optimize TensorFlow and other framework for the hardware that we have on Google Compute Engine. Uh, so basically, if you're spinning up a, a VM on the Google Compute Engine and you're choosing special deep learning OS that we have, you probably will be using our custom version of TensorFlow precisely optimized for the GPUs and CPUs that we have on the platform. Uh, before I'm going to proceed, there's a talk, quick question. How many of you guys actually using TensorFlow? Okay, it's impressive. How many of you guys using PyTorch? So why have you come to this talk? But anyway, uh, <laughs> um, okay. So let me first uh, uh, say kudos for authors of this presentation who are not here. Several of them are from the TensorFlow team. Uh, several of them are from my team. Huge thanks to all of them because it wouldn't be possible uh, without them. Now let's uh, uh, jump to the agenda. As you might have guessed, we split the talk on two parts. First, we're going to cover the theory of distributed training. Oh, yep, if there was any questions. Oh, okay. Uh, first, we're going to cover the theory of distributed training. And inside of the theory, I want uh, to answer two simple questions. How you can do a distributed training uh, which type of distributed training you need to pick, and why. Then we will see on the practice how you can actually apply all of them with the TensorFlow, and what is more important, we will see how on the practice you can take and some legacy model that was implemented five years ago, let's say, or, or three, or, or some, some old, old model, uh, and use the modern practices of doing distributed training. So let's first stop, we'll start with theory. Before we're going to jump in, several uh, just a simple icons that I'm going to be using. These are official icons of uh, Google Cloud. First of all, one is virtual machine on Google Compute Engine. Uh, the second one means that VM that I'm showing is high CPU instance without a GPU. And the third icon is GPU. Uh, I know that GPU icon is kind of look the same as uh, VM and GC, but these are official icons, so just bear with me. Uh, okay, so let's start with asking question why to distribute. If you want to do a distribution, you probably need to uh, ask three questions. Question number one, uh, if you have a model of hands, how fast you need to train this model? So basically, how fast you want to experiment. If you're trying one model per day, maybe training one day is fine for you. Maybe you need to train one hour or two hours or maybe one week. As soon as you have a realization how much time you need to spend on training the model, uh, you need to answer the question, uh, what the level of the accuracy that is good enough for your business needs? As soon as you have these two questions answered, that you, let's say, uh, absolutely fine training is within two hours, and uh, the level of the accuracy, let's say, 89%. Uh, the third question is, what are the cheapest way to do the training to satisfy these business requirements? And with distributed training, I'm basically saying that the rule of sum is the same as with concurrency programming. I used to, to tell to my students, if you're thinking to do concurrent, and if you can avoid it, in any possible way, please don't do concurrent programming. The same is here. If you can avoid distributed training in any possible way, please do avoid it. Uh, but okay, let's say, uh, let's now speak more precisely why you might want not to do distributed, and then we'll speak how to distribute it if you're still willing to do so. So this is uh, a chart that I'm going to show, you, uh, to show uh, just to illustrate some compromise that you will have to, to, to have when you're thinking about distributing. On the x-axis, I have the configuration of different type of instances. And I'm going to show you the speed of the training of a ResNet with synthetical data on different type of the instances. So y-axis is actually speed of training. It's not going to be up to scale. Uh, okay, the first instance is 96 CPU Skylake. Uh, 
Uh, if you're going to use a special deep learning VM that basically we have, that have a special TensorFlow optimized for the Skylake, you might have 200 images per second. Uh, this is like an ideal case. Let's say that this is not uh, what you want. You need to go faster. So you might actually spin up the instance with one volt uh, GPU, and you will have around 800 images per second. Again, this is ideal case with TensorFlow 111. We recently have released 112, but the numbers will be approximately the same. These two numbers is what we'll be, we'll be calling baseline. Uh, effectively, we're calling it baseline because in the second instance, we're using only one GPU. Let's say that even this is not enough. You need to go faster. Uh, then you spin up a GPU machine, and on the right-hand side, these two configurations, what I like to, to, uh, to call it is Fatty Tail Zone. And why Fatty Tail Zone? Because like, if you're spinning up a machine with a GPU, you're probably expecting the speed of training would be 720 multiply 8, which is like roughly 6,000. This is reasonable to expect. You now have a GPU, there is no network, all of them and within one box, this is a reasonable expectation. Uh, even more, let's say even this is not enough. So now I want to spin two instances. Uh, again, I probably would expect for 6,000 multiplying two, something around 12,000 images per second. This is my expectation. And again, this is fairy tale zone. In reality, of course, you're paying the prices of the overhead. If you're using a GPU, uh, you probably will get something roughly like 5,000 images. Again, this is a close to ideal case. You might get even worse situations. So you're paying effectively 10% of the overhead just to go uh, multi-GPU. This 10%, uh, it's roughly, I'm trying to recall the actual price, might give you around $1 per hour. Um, yeah, $1 per hour that you around $1 per hour that you're just paying for this overhead. Things getting even worse uh, if you're going uh, with network. With network, effectively, you're paying almost 25% of the overhead just to, uh, to go in the distributed mode. Reasonable question that the business might ask, does it actually make sense to go to distribution mode? Uh, here is another chart that basically shows you how much speed up you gain uh, and how much more cost you pay. So effectively, as you can see, it's, uh, it's still better, it's still worse, uh, sorry, it's still worse the money to continue growing the speed if you do need to speed up. At some point, this both, uh, both line will converge, and the price will probably will go higher than the speed up that you're getting from the training. But if you're still willing to wait, uh, let's say you don't want to spin up two or three machines, you actually want to use one machine but to wait more, uh, price will be actually lower because you no longer get paying overhead of the network. And if you, again, if you can avoid doing distribute, you should avoid doing distribute. Uh, to answer the question whether this difference in the price that you pay is worth the time that you're getting, it's up to you guys and the business to decide. Okay, so now let ju let's uh, jump to question uh, which type of distribution exists in theory. Uh, and we will start with multi-GPU distribution. Effectively, how you can distribute the training if you have one physical instance and you have many GPU within one physical machine. Let's say this is your VM. You spin up a brand new VM, you have eight V100, eight Voltas, and you want to train your, your model. Let's say this is your model. I know it's not practical, not many people in real life have the model with uh, five elements in your computational graph, but for the sake of the example, let's say this is your model, uh, and you actually want to train this small model on V100. Okay, like, as long as you have money, you can do whatever you want. Uh, one of the type, uh, and of the way how you can do distributed training for this super crazy graph, is to actually copy-paste this graph to all the V100. Each of the U100 will be training the same graph. It will be executing forward pass, backward pass, applying the gradient, and doing it again and again. Now, the question arises, if all of these V100 is doing the training on the same computational graph, how are you going to actually synchronize the graph between each other? Uh, one way of doing so is uh, the called uh, all-reduce. Uh, 
the special algorithm that basically going to synchronize uh, um, elements of the graph between all the uh, GPUs on the on the your physical instance. And what's the most famous all reduce algorithm is ring all reduce. Ring all reduce basically says uh, looks something like this, and this is slide from the technical blog of Uber. Uh, the Uber have done a drastic work to implement a Horowat high-level framework that actually based on the ring on reduce and heavily uh, speeds up the distributed training of the uh, distributed training of TensorFlow. We will speak up about later in the practice phase. But the whole idea of uh, the ring on reduce that each of the worker, each worker could be one GPU or one instance in your cluster, sends a part of the gradient to the next worker, and at the same time receives part of the gradient from the previous worker. Effectively, this means that each worker connects to next neighbor and previous neighbor, and forms something that looks like a ring or circle, uh, whatever they like, like more. The good thing about this part is that each worker is utilizing, uh, utilizing both channels, download and upload at the same time. So you kind of can squeeze all the possible performance from the communication channel in between uh, your instances. Uh, as basically you might guess, you need to build communication between GPU something like this. Each of the GPU and the instance should have precisely two connections, to the next neighbor and previous neighbor in order to give you the high speed ring all reduce topology uh, for your synchronization with ring all reduce. Now, uh, if you spin up Deep Learning VM on Google Compute Engine and you will run NVIDIA SMI Topo, this matrix, this basically special NVIDIA tool that gives you all the connectivity between GPU that you have on the hardware. Uh, this is something that you can just run this uh, CLI, get this connectivity, and NVIDIA V100 has six NVLinks. NVLink is a special technology from NVIDIA that allows to uh, connect two GPU between each other, creating the high-speed connections. Uh, in this particular diagram and uh, this matrix that you see, important part of this part. You can see that each GPU basically has NV three NVLink connection to one GPU and three NVLink connection to another GPU. So each of the GPU precisely connected with, uh, with two neighbors, uh, allocating all the connection speed uh, to previous and the next neighbor. Actually, if we're going to graph exactly this particular connectivity to our previous picture, you probably will get something like this. This is 6 and link that design on the hardware level to speed up, wrinkle, reduce uh, in the uh, best possible way. So this is one way how, in theory, you can do a distribution. You can copy the graph on all the GPUs. We will see how to do it in practice, and then apply some level of synchronization. The second way, uh, which actually uh, came due to historical reasons, still sits around, called model distribution. The previous one uh, uh, called data distribution. The idea behind the model distribution that, again, you have the same graph with five nodes. Again, please don't train the five nodes graph on V100. Uh, and this time, you're distributing the graph. You're no longer copying the whole graph on each particular GPU. You're copying a part of the graph. In this particular graph uh, example, uh, you have one GPU having one node, another GPU have another node, then one GPU have two nodes, and so on and so on. Uh, effectively, this type of distribution is the most complex one, because you, as a developer of the graph, actually need to decide how you're going to distribute graph across the GPUs. You need to take the account connectivity between GPUs, like if you have a, a ring topology that we saw, it's not practical to have diagonal connection like we have in this example, because there is no direct hop between them. Okay, so uh, this is model distribution. As soon as you, as a developer of the graph, have created a distribution across the different GPUs, you might see, okay, I have eight of the V100s, and I distributed my graph across four of them. How am I going to use another four? For another four, you can actually apply uh, now high-level data distribution. So now you have a logical graph that sits on four GPUs, and you have a copy, another logical graph that sits on four GPUs. And now you can do a data distribution. You have two copies of the graph. Both of them can train separately and use a ring to synchronize data between these two logical graphs. Uh, so this so far we have uh, have uh, covered distribution within one instance. Small conclusion. 
So we have a data distribution. It's kind of simple to implement because for you as a developer, usually it's absolutely transparent. You're saying, here's my graph, please do all the magic. And usually framework that you're using knows how to copy the graph across all the GPUs and knows how to synchronize them. Uh, then, usually, uh, due to popularity of this, uh, of this type, you have a hardware optimization, hardware that precisely designed to do ring or reduce. Uh, the second type is model distribution, which is actually hard to implement. Please don't do it, but due to historical reason, it's still around, and we will cover why. And then you have the most complex one, hybrid distribution, when you're kind of doing model distribution, and then you're copying this uh, model that sits on 4GPU and doing a high-level data distribution. This one is the hardest one, uh, but it's still used in the legacy code. Uh, okay, now, multi-node. Uh, Multi-node is basically has the same idea behind the distribution. The first one is model distribution. Only in this case, you're spinning up not the many GPUs, but many instances. This type of distribution used to be around uh, probably five years ago-ish, I think, 2012. Five, six, uh, six years ago. Okay, so this is actually a picture of, from the disbelief white paper. Disbelief is the framework for deep learning that we used to have in Google before the TensorFlow came up. Uh, and uh, the disbelief by that time uh, was heavily utilizing CPU training. So in this particular case, we have four instances, each has 96 CPUs cores. Uh, and therefore, in order to create a huge model, you do need to have a model distribution. In this particular case, due to the nature of the model, usually researchers were uh, designing topology of the model, were precisely specifying how many machines it need to be distributed on. And then, when you finish doing describing your topology of the model, you can do a more high-level data distribution when you have uh, uh, these four, uh, each four nodes is a logical copy of the graph. And now you have uh, four clusters, each of the clusters doing a data distribution. They effectively training the graph on the part of the data. And then you would have what is called parameter server. Parameter server is special designated uh, machines, hardware machines, that is used just to save uh, uh, your, your, your model. Now, this is uh, model and... Uh, hybrid type of distribution. You can also do a data distribution as we discussed on the GPUs. Effectively, idea the same. Just copy a graph across all the nodes. If your nodes has enough power, you have a GPUs and you have enough memory, just copy all of them. And now we need to synchronize them. Synchronization, the idea is basically the same. You can do a ring. And if you're doing a ring, you need to be sure that all of your work are actually reliable, or of your work are, have high uh, connectivity bandwidth network between each other. Uh, in some cases, if you're not sure about this, you can split your ring on two. You can have two rings. Now, in this particular case, let's say you have a fast connectivity between worker two and three. So you can create a ring for the fast synchronization of the model between them. And then you have a green arrow that effectively two nodes ring. Uh, that second ring you can start only when the first ring is over. So usually you can technically split your, um, your cluster on subparts that has a high connectivity between each other. Now, the next one is distribution that's still around is parameter server. When effectively you're no longer sending the small chunk of your, uh, of your gradient, uh, gradient step, you're sending the whole gradient step to the parameter server, and the parameter server is the source of truth of your model. Um, this was one of the most widely used type of distribution in Google uh, way back then, and there were several reasons uh, because of this. First of all, you can utilize heavily this schema uh, if one of the workers go down, it's not a problem. Other workers will continue working because they no longer rely on the uh, circle ring. They're no longer waiting until they will receive all the part of the gradient step from all the members of the rings. Therefore, you can technically use this model of distribution with a lot of preemptible machines, a lot of instances that are not reliable, or if the connection is not reliable. Uh, now, people always ask, uh, which of these two models should they, should they be using nowadays? And like, there is no silver bullet. Effectively, if you know that you have a reliable connection between instances, instances are fast, you probably should go with all reduced topology without parameter servers. 
That is actually why in TPU, we're using only all reduce. You cannot use parameter server with uh, Google Cloud TPU instances. Uh, now, if you want to use something like preemptible instances or you have unreliable connections or you have slow instances, you have CPU instances or any type of uh, uh, instance that can go down, you probably need to use parameter server. Uh, but there is a bottom line. If you're using parameter server, often your workers might using a stale data, they might be using not the latest version of the model, therefore you're paying time for conversion. Now, these are the four distribution models across, uh, across instances. You have uh, ring, you have uh, parameter servers, you have model distribution, you have the hybrid mode. Uh, out of this, if we're not speaking about model, uh, if we're not speaking pr about parameter service at all, data distribution is the simplest one, model distribution is the hard, hybrid is the hardest one. Now the question, if the hybrid distribution is the hardest one, uh, why we still can see official TensorFlow models or other models that still using model distribution? They're still doing this, and you as a developer will probably have to, uh, uh, to work with this. Particularly, this is example from the documentation of neural machine translation model. It basically says that it's doing model distribution, and this leads to a really fascinating results. You're starting your training, and you might see that GPU number one throwing out of memory exception, while GPU number two actually utilizing only 5% of memory, because your model not distributed evenly. Uh, the reason is, uh, can be found in the history of how the TensorFlow itself was developed. If you go back to the disbelief uh, white paper uh, and you look on these two pictures, you will see that model distribution is the hardest part from, the, from that point of time. So the question why in 2012 the people were doing model distribution. Uh, the thing is, in 2012, GPU were just at the beginning. A lot of people were start trying using them for the research, but they used to have small footprint of memory, just six gigabyte, and CUDA computational compatibility were, uh, were not having that much of sophisticated API to implement workaround of the small footprint of memory. Speed of training were not that, uh, that, that fast, and the, uh, and the several more interesting, this is actually chart from the white paper, and it's really interesting. On the white axis, you can see amount of CPU cores that they used to train a huge model. On the Y axis, you will see time to train. All of this is different CPU configuration except that purple triangle. Purple triangle close to Y axis. This is actually GPU time to train. So basically, in 2012, GPU was one of the slowest way of training the huge model. Uh, this is one of the conclusions that, uh, that uh, researcher found, and I will just give you a moment uh, to read it through because this is so n not how it, how it today. Okay, so basically by then, in 2012, uh, training on GPU was not that big of a thing as it today. Nowadays, no one using model distribution, uh, but due to historical reasons, there are many models that you can, can find an example that's still doing this. And we're going to cover in the practice part how you can take model that doing this and actually use it with data distribution that is way more simpler. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, this is basically what ha what have changed in 2010 and why we now training training on GPUs. So let's go to practice part. Uh, practice part. First, good old days, how you used to do distributed training. This part of the source code from the official TensorFlow website that gives you explanation how you used to start the cluster with parameter server and a lot, a lot, a lot of source code. I basically just put it here to, uh, to emphasize how horrible it was. I'm not going to even dive here what you're doing here because you need to do a lot of stuff and usually you would find yourself doing a lot of bugs and mistakes in starting to run this. Uh, community have come with two simplification for doing distributed training. One was designed by Uber and has the name Horobot. Horobot heavily utilizing uh, Ringo Reduce, and it's actually the name of a traditional Russian dance when people dancing with each other and then switching each other and kind of look like a Ringo Reduce. So they decided to call it like this. Distributed strategy is a native concept, new concept in TensorFlow that we're going to discuss. A distributed strategy right now in the process of the development, so you can think of a distributed strategy as something that will be default distribution way in TensorFlow 2.0, but you can actually start using it right now. We will speak uh, why you might wait for, uh, for 2.0. So let's take a small example that is not distributed, 
and let's speak uh, and discuss how we can do it distributed. So here's an example. Simple linear classifier. Let me walk you through all the source code that we have. So we're creating two numerical columns, x1, x2. We're creating small optimizer. Uh, we're crea creating estimator. Uh, we have an uh, input function that just uh, produce random values. And we finally start the training. Now let's see how you can do it in distributed way, way with the Horobot. So Horobot initially, uh, when they were designing the whole idea behind the Horobot, they took they look on the current approach of doing distribute. If you have the model that trying to utilize all the four GPUs, let's say you have an instance, you have four GPU, you have the model that utilizes all of them. Usually you would start TensorFlow, and TensorFlow somehow inside of the model knows how to split the training between four GPUs. Horowat and the people in Uber decided to train this and do it in a slightly different way. They thought, okay, now you're going to spin up a process per GPU. Each of the processes will have TensorFlow that will think that is the only one process on the machine, and it will think that it has only one GPU that it can utilize. So effectively, you have uh, four absolutely independent processes. Uh, now, if you have many, many processes, how are you going to start them? Usually, in Horobot way, you're using OpenMPI, OpenMPI to start different processes, and then Horobot under the hood going to synchronize model between all the processes of the TensorFlow. So it will be kind of transparent for the TensorFlow, and most importantly, Horobot heavily utilizes uh, NVIDIA Nickel and CCL for synchronizing model between instances. The real beauty of this model that technically, if you want to do multi-node distribution, you don't need to change the source code. You just need to change your OpenMPI starting script. That's it. Uh, now coming back to example. This is original example. This is uh, example, the same example with Horowat. And let me give you some uh, explanation what have changed. First of all, we're importing Horowat and we're calling init. This is something that just must, according to documentation. The second part, you wrapping your optimizer uh, within Horobot optimizer. This just a wrapper, it has the same API. Your model source code should not uh, be changed. It just should be absolutely transparent. Then, uh, this is a small, if you want, hack. You're saying if the rank of your particular instance is zero, then save model here, otherwise none. The reason for this, since you spin up a lot of processes, all of these processes are going to train the same model. Therefore, they will have at the end the same model. And you don't want each of the processes trying to save it in the same folder. You technically just want only one process to save it, so you're saying, okay, if your rank is zero and rank is unique ID of the processes, your rank is zero, then you are the one who is going to save the model. Everyone else can, can just ignore it. Uh, then you're specifying config just to point your process of the TensorFlow which particular GPU it can utilize. Uh, Horowat local rank give you the local rank on the machine. If you have four processes, rank will be from zero to three inclusively. And therefore, uh, here each process will utilize its own GPUs without any conflicts. And you're passing this config to your estimator. That's it. Uh, that's all. Almost. Yeah, I forgot about the hook. That you that you absolutely must must apply. Okay, so this is the changes. Uh, usually, it's really small changes. You don't need to change a lot of your uh, of your stuff. And this is how you're starting it. In this particular example, you're starting training with eight GPUs, eight processes on the local machine with MPI run. And as I said, the best part and the beauty of this model that you want to do a training on many machines, you just do this. This is actually how you're starting the same source code to do all reduced distributed training between four different nodes. Uh, in this particular case, I'm going to utilize 32 GPUs. Each of the instance will have eight GPUs. That's it. So you're just scaling it to as many nodes and machine as you want. Uh, another part that uh, Horowat actually gives you, it's not only the simplicity of scale uh, horizontally, it has several more additions, really nice addition. One of them is TensorFusion. TensorFusion is the technology that allows to combine small tensors together and send over the wire only uh, when you have the, uh, the full buffer. This saves some, some amount of traffic. And they have a special visualizer that allows you uh, to debug your, your distributed training slightly simpler. And the second part, distributed strategy. 
Distributed strategy is the brand new API. Right now, uh, distributed strategy lives inside TF Contrib. And TF Contrib is something that in the TensorFlow we're using as, you can think about this as an incubator. So some API never leaves Contrib and might be actually removed. Some API eventually graduated from the Contrib and moved to another part of the TensorFlow when they satisfy the requirement that we want them to satisfy. Uh, in this particular example, distributed strategy is still in the contrib, so we need to take this into account. This means that the API might change in the future. Uh, and they're going to be moved away to of the contrib, so they effectively this API will graduate with TensorFlow 2.0. So you effectively can, can have a sneak peek of how will distribution will look in the future. Distributed strategy right now provides you four different types of synchronization. Uh, the first one, one device strategy, the default strategy. If you're just starting an example, the same example that we use, it will pick one device and visualize it. That's it. Second one is the mirror strategy. Mirror strategy is effectively ring or reduce that we just, uh, just have discussed. And let's quickly, quickly see how you can change this example, same example, to use uh, mirror strategy. Again, same example, changes. So it's even first hard to see where exactly the changes uh, were made because it's literally two places. One, you're creating the mirror strategy distribution instance. Two, you're passing it to your estimator. That's it. You can actually inline this, and you will have only one place where you're saying, I'm, you want to use mirror strategy, and that's it. Uh, TF effectively will, under the hood, try to do ring call reduce and utilize all the GPUs that it have. You no longer need to use uh, open MPI, uh, you can literally don't need to do a lot of other changes, uh, other changes. Then you have collective or reduced strategy. It's the strategy for uh, synchronizing between the instances. Under the hood, collective or reduced using gRPC. This is the biggest difference between Horobot that actually utilizing NCCL from NVIDIA and own TensorFlow implementation that heavily utilize gRPC. We will look uh, on the difference later with uh, benchmarks. Again, same example, what needs to be changed? Unfortunately, a lot. Uh, first, you need to specify config of your cluster. And the, the worst part, you do need to specify index of your worker. Uh, this is interesting because you need to somehow figure out what the index of your current worker that you're starting. You need somehow to start worker. Uh, then you need to actually create the instance of uh, all reduced strategy. And the interesting part here, if you can see num GPUs per worker mean that all of your worker need to have the same amount of GPUs. Uh, it's actually common that your worker will be the same, but uh, time to time, you, you, I saw that the people trying to train on strange configuration when different instances has different amount of GPUs or even type of GPUs. With this type of the strategy, for now, it's uh, not supported. And then you're passing the same config, and you're starting train evaluate. Uh, it doesn't support just train. You have to use train evaluate. So this is basically how you're doing multi-GPU, or sorry, multi-instance distribution with distribution strategy. Now, small conclusion. Uh, this is the comparison of the speed between different, different distributed strategy. Uh, red line is a horror watt, uh, blue line is a distribution strategy. Now, as you can see, uh, while you uh, speak on the one instance up to eight GPUs, you probably do want to go with distributed strategy. It's slightly, slightly slower, but uh, it's probably still within the deviation um, of our measurements. Uh, but it's way simpler. It's only one line that you need to change. That's it. Uh, another important part, the distribution strategy supported by the TF team. So we can file a bug and have uh, expectations about the time of reacting on that bug. Uh, if you're using Horowitz, I don't know, I cannot, I cannot speak on the behalf of Uber. It's up to them to decide how soon they actually can fix the bug inside of the Horowat. If you're speaking about multi-node distribution here, for now at least, Horowat is faster. And the hypothesis why it's faster like this, because they actually utilizing nickel, while TensorFlow native distribution utilizing gRPC under the hood. And it will take some time to TensorFlow to actually optimize gRPC communication to be on the same level as nickel right now. Um, so yeah, for multi-node, I would suggest to at least look on the distribution strategy because it's the future. It's what you will have to, uh, to use in 2.0. Uh, because even the horror what effectively will migrate to distribution strategy APIs. It will be just another distribution strategy. Uh, that's it. 
So this is comparison of different distribution strategies that can apply. And huge thank you and questions. Questions. Okay, so if no questions, you can find me outside. Thank you guys.